I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Simon Holland, known to over 100,000 fans online as the indomitable Professor Simon, producer of a highly popular series of educational and entertaining videos on YouTube. What Professor Simon's fans may be less aware of is his decades-long career in broadcast television production and editing, which includes editing for the BBC, Nat Geo, Discovery, Smithsonian TV, Channel 4, and Channel 5. Simon has also produced films for the University of Hawaii NASA-funded program Finding Earth Killer Asteroids, as well as a French recorded history project. He joins us today to talk about the role of media, memes, and storytelling in the modern media landscape. So Simon, welcome, <sighs> sir. It is a true pleasure to have you with me today. As it's I great mentioned, to be here. Thank you. As I mentioned in the intro, you are you're currently serving an audience of over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube <laughs> with millions of views of your videos. Now, before this, you had a full career in broadcast television production. So right. taking that into account, how many people would you estimate have seen your work <laughs> over your career? Millions, <laughs> tens of millions, more than that? Well, it's interesting when you work in TV, you've got no idea. <laughs> I mean, you get audience um, reports the next day and hopefully, you know, you get a decent audience share. It, it varies in, in Britain, being a smaller country where I worked most of my life, a good viewing figure was like two to three million, which is a good proportion. And but then working for PBS or Nat Geo or Discovery, when it's more global, I have no idea. They don't really tell you. Um, and that's one of the things that we should talk about, about the kind of how TV is so different from social media. Um, yeah. I mean, the yeah. big hits that I've worked on are things like... I'll, as a junior, I worked on with Alec Guinness on Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. I've worked on Agatha Christie's films, which have gone all around the world. And then probably the probably the biggest um, TV program that I think most people have seen, and it's amazing because I get people telling me about it, and that is why is Yellowstone National Park going to blow up in a super volcano? And yeah. it, at one time when Discovery first came out, I used to sit, sit when I lived in the US, switch from the telly and go, I've seen this before. <laughs> well, but now it's, yeah, it's different. You know, I'm going to, so yeah, with those movies added in, I'm going to put this at the tens to hundreds of millions at the least, you know? And so my, my exposure pales in comparison to that. Although <laughs> I, I've been on BBC, I've been on yeah. Nat Geo, Discovery, right. and Channel right. 4, I think. Oh, so, great, great. Yeah, great. And, and it, you know, as well as, as well as several others that, that weren't mentioned. So I have a little bit of experience, but certainly not the breadth and depth. Sure, but, sure. Have you um, done um, PBS, WGBH in Boston, Frontline, and that kind no, of thing? No, or no, haven't, haven't done those. Um, right, and you know, and this this was this was years ago, and and you know, and sure. as you know, most people aren't aware of this, right? But um, right. most of these TV studios, maybe all of them, don't film their own stuff. They have different production companies, and so right. Yeah, this was back when I was doing, you know, I was doing previous projects and you'd have these guys basically steamroll right. through, right? They call you up, they say, we're doing a series yeah. on this. We want you to speak right. on on this tech topic or this science topic. And, you know, next right. thing you know, production crew rolls up, they spend all day yeah. there, hop on a plane right. and they go to their next person. So T totally, it it, it it is an industry and yeah, it's very much a kind of a, Churn them in, churn them out. And, yes. uh, you know, time is money. And as you say, um, at one time, CBS, PBS, um, BBC would have internal market and have their own camera people and directors mm. and editors. And that's where I started working in uh, what was Ealing Film Studios, which was television film studio um, taken over from the film days by the BBC. And that was the mobile base for camera, sound, and the head of editing, the editing department. And everything was done in-house. But then by the 80s, when the whole culture in Britain changed to the kind of Thatcher era, everybody became self-employed. And a lot of people left, set up their own small production companies. Very strangely, I ended up working with all the same people I'd worked with internally at the BBC, now running, you know, their own 
independent lens production company supplying back to the BBC. And, and you know, I was also working for the BBC. It, it, nothing had changed apart from uh, they stopped paying your pension. <laughs> that, ah. that was about... That's the only thing that really changed. Yeah, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and slightly budgets were were slightly different as well. I mean, when the the broadcasters, it was all slightly funny money. You know, they had the BBC is obviously a funded by license fee payers, and you didn't really ever think about how much something costs. But they were very frugal, but. Um, when you're working for an independent, every penny counts, and you get into a big row about, oh, yeah. um, you know, about about what the commissioning editor wanted, what you were really going to do, what you'd over promised, and then what they saw. I, I mean, I, as the editor, have often been at the center of that. Where um, my classic story, Tim, is this person said, "Well, what, sold the program to Discovery." I'm making this up, by the way. That. Barack Obama will be hang gliding over Everest and uh, oh great you're commissioned and then of course they didn't film him and they they filmed some people uh, doing some fishing in Nepal so the executive comes and sits down next to me and goes I can't wait to see how did the Barack Obama sequence go and I go oh what we never did that but we've got a really good fishing sequence and they go what I want my money back, kind of thing. <laughs> I've been there. It's just absolutely hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Now, again, it, it's from a guest perspective. I saw a, a very different perspective, right. but the other side of a lot of this, uh, one of the ones that I used to see, and at, at the time I was doing work with like John Hutchison. I remember talking a lot right. about this with right. him, right? And he, he did over, I think, 300, maybe close to 400 television shows over like a 20, 25 year oh, period. And, right. and you know, we, we would joke about stuff like every TV crew that comes up, um, you know, they, they introduce themselves, they set up their equipment, they get the lighting, they do the lighting check, the mic check, they get you all tucked right. in, you know, and then they go, we want you to open the door and pretend like you're just meeting us. And right. I'm like, Wait a minute, you've been here for an hour. Right. It, you know, right. I mean, you've gone right. through my entire house. We have no secrets. You know, you've looked at my lab, my equipment, the whole nine yards. You know, right. it's like, oh, you know, hi. And I was like, and and yes. every crew <laughs> does this, you know, and, and so that that was one of the, you know, the common jokes. And there were a few other things as well, but. Oh, um, totally. I mean, one of the things in science um, storytelling in construction, uh, you a scientist, a team of scientists have often solved the problem. You've read about it in a peer review science journal. You're going to make a film, which is great. And you go and meet them. And the first question is, take us back to the time before you knew the answer. And they kind of go, Ooh. you know, and, and it's very hard for people to I remember and also tell that story in a in a realistic way. We looked at everything and we had no idea what it could be. Of course we did because we solved it in a minute. And so you have to take them through that process, which yeah. is, which is it's good for storytelling, but yeah, it must be very confusing for well, sci scientists are very interesting because they often have a brain the size of the planet, but they don't know really how to communicate. Um, their ideas or their concepts and, on television. You know, as as you know, that that is one of the main reasons that I'm doing this interview series because what right. I found is not just scientists but professionals and innovators. Mm. Right? They they mm. live in their minds, and sometimes it can be difficult for them to communicate. And so Definitely. one of the things that I, I at least strive towards, I'm not sure if I always get there, but one of my hopes is, you know, can I help you communicate those ideas? Uh -huh to to a larger audience you know and i know you do yeah. that with your work as well although in sure. your approach it's it's a little bit more traditional editing and film assembly right so right 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 i mean i think i think he i've always been a big fan in the documentary um way of telling stories and having a kind of an arc to a story a beginning a middle and an end and and you know title and then the classic cut to the chase which is obviously a hollywood term of the best bit first and 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 that's what i do and i think 
that um, it's not very, um, it's actually quite out of the ordinary today in this social media age of, of YouTube. And I think because of me being a kind of kid from the 50s and growing up in the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, I think I have an audience who kind of appreciate that storytelling because I see stuff on YouTube that is brilliant, but it breaks all the rules. And I think, why didn't they just edit that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> And there's bits that they could just have cut out or the classic thing that slightly frustrates me is the very long four-way Zoom chat about UFOs where there's four guys with baseball caps on backwards saying, there's a UFO out there. And another one goes, yeah, I know they're coming. And I was going, I just got one. You know, actually tell us some facts, tell us some science and actually discuss it. It's not just, why would you sit for, oh, the, the other giveaway is you see the film is two hours and 15 minutes long. Or it's a conference and it's somebody with the whiteboard and a PowerPoint presentation. I, I've me, done a few of those. I've done a few of those. Yeah. I know, but that's not a film. You want to, I want to take you, Tim, and take you into a location and talk to you about how you feel about your presentation and, you know, and actually t t tell it as a story. Um, but on the other hand, I enjoy listening to podcasts while I'm on my way to work or something, which is, which which is good. Yeah. Well, so let me let me get into the online media aspect of things because that's what right. you're doing right now. Now, and one thing I should mention, you mentioned this to me before the interview. You are uh, put quotes on it, quote unquote, officially retired. So, as an officially retired person, you're still working eight to twelve right. hours a day, right? But but now you're doing it on your own terms. Is that, I is love that it. okay? No, no, right. It's right. I, I think the retired um, uh, uh, name is really only <laughs> retired. I've kind of moved on from work, working in broadcast. Um, I think uh, for me, I actually think broadcast television has to change and it has changed. Yeah. And it's very different from the days that I worked in it. And I and actually I'm really enjoying Tim social media broadcasting because it's so different. Uh, a story. Um, so a lot of TV programs are very uh, agenda driven. So they have an approved um, subject. Uh, a director or a producer goes out with a story that they want to tell. They'll come and interview you, and they'll keep interviewing you until they know in their mind. You, Tim, have said what they want you to say for their film. Well, and then, you know, and that, I, I, well, well, I mean, they won't misrepresent you. Yeah. But they'll keep on, on. Um, but so, what do you really think about this? And, and how does, you know, until you eventually say, yes, you know, it's been hard doing this or whatever. And that, and that's what, and then you find in the finished program, um, you know, Ken Ventura says, yes, it's hard, or whatever, or some positive statement, because that's what they want. And in the <clears> end, I got a bit fed up with that, because one of my um, other places I worked was a BBC had this department way back when video first came out that did video diaries. We actually wanted to give cameras to real people to make their own TV programs, and I facilitated in helping teaching people how to shoot them and tell stories. And that's what I, if only TV did that more rather than this closed book, we know we have an agenda, the film goes out, we close it and experts who know more or people who phone in or write in and say, I think you got it wrong. We're never going to do a follow-up. So social media suddenly has unlocked that for me. And my audience are incredibly smart. My patrons yeah. are smart. They suggest subjects. They, I share early cuts, really rough cuts at, on Patreon that they get to see. They make comments. They point out spelling mistakes and other mistakes or research. And then eventually it goes to YouTube. And I've started now in the last few i've tried to i've tried to slightly reinvent myself after this hundred thousand subscriber anniversary of really concentrating on redefining my 
slightly caught with this catchphrase, the truth is out there, because what I mean by that is you as an audience are out there. Everybody has spent their entire life as a specialist if you've made whipped cream sandwiches or you've worked in Lockheed Martin in aerospace, you have spent your entire life, if you're our age, uh, being an expert in a field. Share it if you can, and let's actually get nearer to the truth because viewers are what it's about. And I'm just loving it. And and, and it, it's really working. And I, I've met so many interesting people who email me all the time. Just the last couple of days, I've been, I asked a very thought provoking question about magnetrons. Where did they come from? I mean, they appeared overnight and could they be, and I was being devil's advocate here, could they be extraterrestrial? Were they given to us by from the planet itself? Obviously not, but the history prior to the failed magnetrons that are the driving force of our radar kit um, was mysterious. And yeah. um, I got all these people who said, I work for GEC. I work for Marconi. We built magnetrons. Uh, we built the alloys that built the yes. special magnets. It's it's the okay. hidden the hidden history. Yeah. So so I I have actually in this I'm going to jump back into a TV question here, and this is one of the things that I yeah. noticed. Okay, and and again, people that you know people in that community had, had relayed the same thing. So um, yeah. as as a guest, right, the TV crew shows up. You sit down. Yeah. But they've got their lighting going. They've got you all mic'd up, and they do yeah. somewhat similar to what I do. You know that that they'll they'll film your your research, your devices, your environment. You know all of that stuff. Um, one of the things that I found is they like to do cutscenes, right? They like to do the talking head stuff. And so, in terms of the talking head, usually they'll they'll say, like you said, "Tell us about this. Tell us about that." Yes. Well, yeah. what I noticed was for every. I, I would say for every 10 hours of filming and it can go that long sometimes, right. Mm -hmm. Where you're taking mm -hmm. water breaks and pee breaks and you know, the whole nine yeah. yards for every 10 hours yeah. of filming, they may use one hour of footage, right. Uh, you know, so, right. Uh, sometimes less, I mean, and so you'll have a crew there all day long filming everything. I mean, you know, it's, it's like sure. they just go through it with a fine tooth comb. And then when you see the finished product, you know, like you said, you've got like a 10 second soundbite, you know, Tim Ventura said this and I'm like, well, wait a minute, you were there for a yeah. day. Context. So, <laughs> right. so or one of the things that I had wondered was, and th this, this isn't, this may not apply to me, but this would apply to th think of all the famous people. It, many of them have passed who have done yeah. these 10 second sound bites, Right. Right. Wouldn't there be thousands of hours on the cutting room yeah. floor that you could use? Is that still there or do they throw that away? Yeah, throw it away. I mean, literally, I think it's changed over the years. When we shot on 35 mil or 16 mil film, a, direct, a good documentary um, director, drama is completely different, is actually drama is more efficient. Um, documentary would normally be given a ratio of about three to one three rolls of film for one 10 minute roll that worked you know and you would cut it and that would be a kind of a normal cutting schedule when uh videotape came out that jumped overnight to the blue box of the sony uh beta cam or yeah. digi beta cam blue box and suddenly it became 32 minutes to one and now with digital media, it's two hundred to one. They just keep turning. I mean, who you know, just shove it in well, another yeah, SD card. You know, I I do the same. I mean, like I do photography, sure. right? And I have a digital Nikon, and the, yeah, I mean, right. I've got batteries and memory sticks. So I'll just you know sure. keep shooting, keep sh and, you know, and and yeah. Uh, what, what I've noticed is for me in terms of shots, it's about a ten to one. I'll have about ten throwaway photos. That's I'm good. Not, I, I'm not yeah. the best photographer, you know, but. So I, right. but but hey, you know when you when you're throwing away digital media, you just okay, delete, done, right? But but right. I, it it seems like it's different when you're interviewing again specialists and important people, presidents, politicians, things like that. That was why I wondered if they yeah, hung on to I, it. It, it. I mean, I think it comes down to storage. I think I think maybe digital is actually easier. Certainly, the BBC has a massive uh, library of of um, the rushes as it was called, the dailies of uncut stuff. Because on film days, you would shoot on a negative stock 
produce a print which you cut, but the negative would never be cut. So you would, um, you know, you would you would keep that. And absolutely, I bet there's amazing stuff in the archive, as that as tape and the media and the cost of everything changed. I don't think things were kept. Um, I think programs that are doing um, like natural history programs definitely keep everything because they might be filming over a number of years with the polar bears or yeah. climate change or something. But I think most interviews, as I said earlier, they're waiting for you to say what they want you to say. And um, usually most directors, and I've you know been a director in BBC as well, is you, by your executive producer, you say, when you go and speak to Tim, make sure he says A, B, and C. And you're going, I hope he said it, because when you come back with your stuff, it's your, did Tim say this? And you go, uh, yeah, kind, not kind of? Yes, yes, here it is. Oh, yeah, okay. That, yeah, that, we, well, we've got what we need. And the rest just gets chucked. And that's and that again, this this goes back to one of the big differences with YouTube is this flexibility. Like right now, right. you know, I'll, I'll break the bubble for the audience, but I've got a series of like 10 questions that I'm pretty much ignoring at this point. Right. Because, you know, for, I, I use them as as fallback and in information. And one of the things that I found is right. especially speaking with scientists, I've had moments in there when I first started doing interviews, I've had moments where I would just be like, uh, what do I say next? And so I'm like, you know what? Right. No, no, let's let's write this stuff down. But, okay. you know, uh, in in scripted TV, like you said, they want you to say this because it mm. fits with the narrative. And that's been established before it was even shot. Right. So. Oh, it's just a, a, a funny story. So we did this film on mega tsunamis, large landslides that collapse into the ocean and can produce a tsunami wave much higher than an earthquake shift. And that landslide, you know, can be incredible. And um, a couple of um, local fishermen in Alaska witnessed a landslide while they were in an Alaskan fjord and they were in their boat overnight and the rock face fell down and they saw this wall of water coming towards them and it overturned a boat, but they survived. I, I saw that show. I saw that show. <laughs> well, let me tell you something that's hilarious about that show is so the producer was told um we'll use them to demonstrate that it could happen in you know in alaska um but it's at the point of the show quite early where we don't yet discover what is the mechanism that causes these large tsunamis so the executive said to this producer get John and Jeff on the boat to say, when I saw the wall of water coming towards us, I had no idea what possible mechanism could have caused. Well, they couldn't say it. It was just like, no. And they were going, no, can we do that again? And he goes, I never use the word mechanism. No, I know you don't, but I've been told as a director. So in the end, I if you see that shot where those two guys are on the boat, it's a reconstruction, you can see their eyes going, I have no idea what mechanism, because we they're were reading holding, a, they're reading a sign. We, were all, yeah. we held up a card because we knew we'd be in such trouble with the exec if they didn't say that, because that was the turning point in the movie. And that was what they had to say. And of course, they it was completely out of their normal language. And it still makes me laugh when I, as you say, it's quite a popular movie. And next yeah, time yeah, it I, comes I, around. I've seen, yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah, again, all of those, you know, it's, it's a, what do they call it? Edutainment, I think, right? So well, well yeah we 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 earned it I called it a different at the time we called it weather porn so it would be yellowstone and um supermassive black holes and um and mega tsunamis and, and and things like that and it was popular in the in the 90s and it was really good we should maybe talk about this about how science on television has changed over the eras and, um, and i i'm seeing a change yeah. in programming and that's natural over right. time but like one of the things right. i'm thinking i i don't i don't watch tv myself 
But every time yeah. I go over to my parents' house with my daughter, right, they, yeah, they watch right. TV. Um, the big one, at no surprise, is Top Gear, right? Because my dad likes British TV. And so, you know, Top right. Gear is always on. Um, and then he, right. he, he is watching this thing about gold diggers, gold panners. You know, sure. every time I go over, that's on. And I just want to claw my eyes out. It's like, <laughs> you know, and, and the thing that gets me is, and not to be critical to whoever makes that show, but it's almost no. like they, they no. ran out of plot. They're like, okay, right. reality show about gold diggers. And, right. and then you could see right. they're building the suspense in, right? He goes to start right. the tractor and the tractor won't start. And I'm like, oh, absolutely. It's all constructed. Yeah. yeah you know, and I just, whenever I see that, I'm like, wow, man, you guys are scraping rock bottom bottom you know quite literally in this case but well i i i try to avoid working in those kind of programs because they tend to be overly constructed and there's lots of kind of hit, uh, tricks to make them and uh, and they are well made and they have good audience and they're very much character um driven if you remember orange county choppers with the, the family who would build the motorbikes and uh, that was super popular. So a lot of other people copied that format and they would do, um, you know, banana county choppers on some other. And it wasn't popular because they didn't have the magic of the actual yeah, personality characters. No, it, 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 you can't just copy that format. But science is very interesting. I'm afraid right now we're in an era where there's very little science or difficult science on on television i mean flagship program like nova does continue in in the us and um the british equivalent is called horizon made by the bbc uh, and it occasionally they make a real cracker um but let me tell you how i i'm old enough to see it change when i first worked at the bbc science was a didactic lecture they would have a well-known voice uh, who would be telling you something and it'd be 50 minutes of just this kind of, and you would, it would feel like you've been educated and it um, was quite low viewing figures. Um, and then we, us young Turks came in and started the whole movement of storytelling and making the, um, using drama construction for documentaries. That was the big, shift and so you'd have a three-act structure you didn't know you know what could it be we looked everywhere we couldn't find it at, found out find out and then maybe there was a tiny clue and that led to the discovery i kind of spread that out over three acts and we used a lot of music and um and and other channels copied it in a very kind of overly dramatic way and then that all finished Come the early uh, 21st century and what the broadcasters and the funders changed to was process. They wanted to be embedded with the scientists while they found a discovery, which is kind of hard. But but that was what they really wanted. They wanted to be there with the virologist or you know, how did you find the vaccine? Or did you, how did you spot the asteroid? Uh, you know, at the moment they go, hang on, you know, again. And and that's that took over from the overly dramatic music and um uh, storytelling into much more realistic or as I said, embedded um programs. And I I certainly I I enjoy those. They're they're fantastic, but they all still had a an agenda. And I think yeah. now, um, with everybody throwing away their TV uh, and ch cherry picking well, what they want to watch, yeah, you know. and that that brings up some really important topics. Yeah, I mean, actually, behind me, right. that's that's my TV, and that's the only right. thing that I use it right. for at this point. Um, you know, and but that's not to say that I, I right. mean I, I have a 27 inch screen, so I just watch everything online, and and totally. you know my my daughter does the same thing. Everything she Good. does is on her phone or her computer. She has Netflix. Oh, yeah. She has all that stuff, right. but but it right. allows her to pick. So so it seems like um, we're in a much more competitive landscape because all you have to yeah. do is point and click, and you can have anything you want. And it seems like that is driving sensationalism. Would you agree with that? Oh, completely. I mean, I think um, I have never endorsed the kind of TikTok or YouTube shorts. Yes. 
I mean, <laughs> the whole idea of doing vertical video for less than 60 seconds. What's that all about, Tim? You know, really, I, I, it, uh, I think you can well, tell a really good story in three to five minutes and construct it. Uh, I, I, how you can really do something in 60 seconds. But there are people who do it very well. I've seen, I've been to talks and lectures um, in media uh, organizations who hire people to make these shorts and they're geniuses at it because, you know, I'm used to grabbing an audience in the first 30 seconds uh, to keep them engaged. They grab them in the first three seconds, you know, and really, really pump out whatever their message is. And it's not something that I'm good at, but but they are. Yeah, well, what you're talking about really seems like a jump. And I, I've done this. I haven't done a ton of it, but I've done this. What right. you would describe as commercial editing, right? And so right. that it seems like that would be a different editing process. So when you go to the shorts, I mean, you're really editing for, you know, you've got like these, what, right. three to five second cuts and anything over five seconds, you have to jump uh, to the next frame, you know? Sure. And, 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 and also, I think intellectually, as you mentioned, I think they're quite vapid, really, because in 60 seconds, you're really going to have one big thought, if you have any. And, um, you know, it's just like, OK. And I can just see people clicking on the next, wiping to the next quick hit. Yes, uh, yes. And, I don't and, know. Uh, uh, context matters also right and if you're trying to right. do serious work if you're trying to educate right. people and i know i'm playing the devil's advocate here but yeah, you know i yeah, see my yeah. daughter on the phone and i i when i see her swiping on tiktok it's like okay cat video cat video i'm like right how how are you gonna put something serious in between videos of cats playing with balls of yarn you know it, it's it's context i'm like i don't see right. and so i i stay off of you know i stay off of youtube Instagram is is much the same way. I think they have like a 60 second limit, something along those lines. And so sure. people aren't, they're not there for that kind of content. So no. it seems like it's almost pointless to try. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sounding kind of fuddy duddy, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, and I think it is probably, well, whatever comes around in, uh, Media is literally continually reinventing something. You know, the uh, white is the new black. I've seen it all the time. You know, let's make let's make silent movies. Oh, really? They've done that before, or whatever. And I I'm continually impressed and amazed at the skill and the talent of people who enter the media or social media industry in their skills. And I think people come up with new ideas to present topics, new ways to tell stories all the time. And um, although they seem shocking, sometimes I uh, there's a quite a few things that I watch that breaks all the rules. A lot of a lot of the things I really like on YouTube are basically unedited rushes. I mean, they're not. It's just that the people don't care about editing you know they're just a guy driving a tractor and maybe he sp speeds it up for five seconds with a bit of music but i mean i mean that's not that's not you know a film it's it's a it's something new but it it's entertaining and you know you might learn something or whatever you, it, it passes the time and yeah i, yeah. I like breaking i like people who break <laughs> rules and so well so you know one of the other things that I wanted to ask about was, and yeah. this is, I know this is a jump. There are a few topics like this, but you have done a lot of UFO, UAP related stuff. I have right. as well. The reason, you know, uh, part of it is interest. Part of it is genuine inquiry. It's sure. it's something that is intriguing, but I, I think there's another aspect to it, which is the viewership for that content mm. is easily 10 times higher than it is for any other content. And, and you know, as as I'd written in my mm. notes, neither you nor myself are market makers online, right? So we have to kind of go okay. with with what the demand is, at least to some degree. So do you think that yep. that's driving? I, I, one of the things I've wondered if, well. if is this a feedback loop because people are interested yeah. in UFOs because it's in the media and yet right. the media keeps pumping it out because people are interested in it, right? Is is uh, this well, kind of that's a, 
No, that's a, the, the media, the relationship between the media and what we're seeing in the sky and UAP right now is incredibly interesting because the media just love UFO stories and they're yeah. not asking questions. And I think the real inquiries into um, what is obviously going on, whether it's um, whether it's something strange or whether it's man-made, I see the best possible content and the classic thing if there ever was a genuine ufo alien uh visit you would see it on youtube or twitter first you know and 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 i think that going back to your point about making um ufo films i think there's a clever thing you can do with it because i think ufos are actually a, not very critical thinking and I think it's a good way as a springboard to think with your audience about a wider science topic. Yes, yes, What yes, could yes, they yes, be? Yes, yes, the yes, nature yes. of reality, um, consciousness, um, our universe, time, all those kind of things can be discussed in that UFO um, context. And then also when you do a film on physics, uh, but you have a picture of a flying saucer as your thumbnail, you get more viewers. So um, I don't like UFOs particularly, but I love the science of UFOs. And I love what I love asking some of the questions. Um, unfortunately, the UFO community is very, very uh, set in their camps. So even mentioning the word UAP can drive. Half of my viewers nutty because they want it to be a flying saucer, you know, and 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 it it can be quite frustrating. But what I've tried to do is look at step back and look at some of the science questions and maybe some of the sociological questions and human questions about what we think about visitors or what we think about our perception of what we're seeing. I it's I would. I absolutely agree with you. In terms of interviews, one of the things that I've tried to do is introduce machine learning, artificial intelligence, von Neumann probes, uh, space yeah. colonization, you know, it, and yeah. it's the same thing. It's, right. you know, it's it's you have the attention, you have the audience. Let's use that to help introduce other concepts so that people view this at the very least they view it from multiple perspectives instead of just rehashing you know it's i, I saw a light in the sky you know because i mean oh, right right yeah right you know? people people send me um single point source photographs um taken on a phone at night it's a single point and i go please don't it could be anything and then quite often they they then enhance them they zoom them in and yes. suddenly you've got all these compression artifacts and you you can see the whatever. No, you can't. You're seeing compression artifacts. And I've never really been sent a daytime unusual thing that I've gone, ooh, that's a bit odd. Although the one thing that people do send me, and I think this is so great, and I think it's a it it, it I try and talk about it politely, and it's about perception. It is um big things far away or small things, close. You'll probably remember the very famous um, UFO drone footage in Utah where this white Tic Tac object comes down uh, off the mountain and then flies, whoa, like 20,000 miles an hour past the drone as it's flying along. Well, I've seen that all the time. It's called a fly. <laughs> because what you're not realizing is that drone cameras have a very... Uh, large depth of field and so you know they everything is in focus from the fly which is two inches away from the drone to the tic tac which is half a mile away and i think we're very bad as humans at seeing things and actually understanding um you know speed and distance and size well uh, you know, one of the other things that I've seen, and and again, I think this is well worth mention, is um, so I, I've been following the war in Ukraine, right? There are over 200,000 dead oh, yeah. or wounded Russian soldiers, you know, as of oh, yeah. as of February, and that, that continues right. to increase. 
Um, you know, some of the other news topics are, I mean, inflation seems to have stabilized a little bit, but that was a big mm. jump. You know, it, there, right. there were a lot of really important, newsworthy, meaningful right. stories that aren't getting attention because F-16s are shooting down weather balloons. Balloons, right. And right. so one of the things that I've wondered is, um, you know, is the public allowing themselves to be manipulated with bread and circuses? Totally, totally. And um, I would like to actually go a bit further and say maybe whoever knows a bit more about UAP are using the classic flying saucer trick, which has been pulled as a way of distracting from secret projects. Um, and as I said earlier, the media lap it up. It's another flying saucer story. And they're not asking critical questions about it. They're not looking at the big picture, you know, things that are seen in military operational areas. Uh, why? You know, things that are seen um, tested in test zones, but never else, sent, you know, not not anywhere else. Uh, I think some of the big questions need to be answered. Oh, and, and you know, we're living in a time of, of climate change, and we're living in a time where we're, trans we're, we're really trying hard to transition into a carbon-free world, and, you know, that's ignored. And some of the, as you say, wars and the economics right now is very complicated. Um, yeah, are we really getting a... Uh, it's a good one, Tim. <laughs> we yeah. should do better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's it's interesting. The, the the entire media landscape is interesting. And then another right. thing that I see that's entering this landscape, I guess, is AI. This is something that I've been following for decades. I think many people yes. have. You know, and yeah. in the past, it was always kind of like, here's this new thing. You got to test this. And so you test it, you know, you play with whatever the gizmo is. Right. You're like, okay, like, like Siri right. was the big one, right? Siri is so sure. good. You're never going to believe, you know, and then you right. use it. And you're like, well, yeah, yeah. no, but right. what I'm starting to see now, um, for instance, all of this hullabaloo about AI with chat GPT was right. with version 3.5. So version four was just released last week. It's like 10 right. or a hundred or a thousand times more powerful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing mm -hmm. that I'm starting to see, again, this is over the last year, AI art now that is so real, oh, yeah. you can't tell the difference, sure. it's generated on the fly, you know? It, and so... It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, those... in, in Well, but I have of, a question to you. Uh, um, where are we on the AI kind of hockey stick of a of a curve is it just starting i think we're somewhere in the middle of it and we're not aware that we're well up um a change of society in uh, ai um being vital and useful um but also dangerous because well i can see so many people losing their work you can program you, in yes you're talking about the frog in the boiling water scenario and right, right, i wondered right. about that the other day for for me right. and again and I, I i hope i'm not talking over too much because i'm supposed to be asking questions and not no and not, no, you know, no expository no. like i am but um so i started to really get interested in AI. I'd read about it in college. I had some knowledge. I programmed mm. in Lisp, the whole nine yards. Mm. But Ray Kurzweil in around 2000 mm. blew my mind. I read The Age of Spiritual Machines and it's right. still the ideas. I mean, I, I'm not sure. Are, are you very familiar with his work with Kurzweil? No. No. He, he had, um, at the time, he had big ideas, but then he alluded to even bigger ones. Like for instance, uh. One of the things that he did, and, and this is all, he's, he's playing a little bit fast and loose with numbers. He graphed out this exponential curve of breakthroughs right. in evolution. Right. And you can see it's going, you know, it, it, depending on which way you do the curve, but you can see it's like, right. okay, you know, 10 million years, you know, a million years, right. you know, a thousand years, 10 minutes, you know, and right. What what he is essentially saying is that that machine intelligence is part of a natural evolutionary process, mm. and which in, you know instead of this artificial human thing that we've developed, what he's saying is that evolution is forcing us to develop it because of these evolutionary pressures, and oh, okay. and so that was where 
for me. I was just like hook, line, and sinker right there. I was like, he he yeah, got yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, no, that that's great, Tim, and and that's just what I enjoy about your uh, channel is that you have you have interesting topics. You've done lots of research over the years, and you have fascinating guests. I wake up in the morning and so overjoyed to see somebody that I'd not heard of um, talking about synchronicity, you know, or whatever it is, uh, you know, on, on your channel. And it, it, it it's really compelling because I don't think uh, these people are really having a voice and we need yeah. to listen to them and learn from their expertise. And I'm a bit like that. I mean, I, I wish I had a few more guests, but my people are uh, in the comments and behind the scenes on Patreon, but they know their stuff. And that's just great. And I think this is a brave new world. I'm I'm all for it. It's, um, it's interesting. There is so much happening right now. Absolutely so yeah. much happening. Now, one yeah. of the other things that I've seen, and this goes to YouTube, I'm sure that your yours do this as well, is it is starting to automatically add chapterization in Google search. Right. Have you seen that? I've seen that happen yeah. when I do slideshows. Yeah. It'll go through the slideshow sure. and it can pick out slides and it'll it'll do text recognition and it'll say, okay, here's this chapter. And I'm like, well, when I created that, I never split it up. And I was like, that's amazing, you know? Right, right. So, Oh, so no, YouTube are just, I mean, yeah, no. I wish YouTube was a bit more... Um, open about it's how amazing it is how it how it shares all the stuff so fast over servers when you want it and very much for creators it's difficult it, i find working for youtube a little tricky because i'm used to when you're working for discovery channel you have or whoever you have a, a list of requirements and they have a list of promises you know when they'll pay you and how much and this with YouTube as a creator, I'm finding that um, I'm chasing the algorithm a bit. Yes, and I, and it and you, I never quite know where. Well, I've had classic cases where a quite an average film is suddenly suggested by YouTube, and suddenly lots of people like it. And I think, well, why didn't they do that last week? Or why don't they? Do, and 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 you don't really know where where you stand. I think they're very clever. Just. The same as you with chapterization. I noticed that when you make a video on YouTube that's over eight minutes long, they put mid adverts in a break somewhere in your film um, where you can choose, but they have an automatic algorithm for placing. They're brilliant. You know, they're just at a denouement or a place where you've said something. They're not just simple on a on a piece of empty audio mm. no they're actually contextually the place that you would want to put a break uh to encourage people to watch the adverts but also for the film i mean i'm i'm yeah it's yeah. very clever stuff it it is it is and one of the things that i chalk a lot of that up to is you know they right. i i'm absolutely positive that they saw this coming 20 years ago and so they've probably right. been able to go through and say if we're replacing television which i think they yep. are how yeah. are we going to replace television so totally totally um i th i just think in a kind of gig economy i wish that there as every single film ever shown ever 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 on youtube is made by somebody in their bedroom with a nikon or a canon and a bit of editing software i wish they slightly uh, threw a few more peanuts at creators um i think they have they're doing a kind of slightly rock and roll 60s model where they're saying go out kids and buy a guitar you'll be maybe the next Mick Jagger well of course yeah. you won't be you play down the pub and you're quite good at playing the guitar and you have a few followers and that's it and you go back to your day job and I think you know the Mr. Biggs on YouTube are it's like they're in a zoo where they're getting all the bananas and next door there's this big page where we're existing where they throw us peanuts and say one day you might be mr big and you go no i don't think so i think i think they're slightly playing that um that and so I, 
I would be very tempted not to, to tell a young person to get into making YouTube or know, um, n know that YouTube as a platform is only a start. Um, the other thing that YouTube do, which is fascinating, is that they encourage and um, creators to earn income elsewhere. It's like, well, why don't you just pay us? You know, so suddenly there's T-shirts and Super Chat and Patreon and sponsorship deals. And, and yeah, no, they're right. But I think they should really be funding a um, a a quality control and a uh, a creator base. I mean, the other thing, I, I'm a bit on a rant now. Sorry, Tim. The other thing I'd like to say is that I worry that um, YouTube could easily turn into blockbuster video, whereas you used to go to the video store and there on the back shelf was the black and white art house movies in French. And then when Blockbuster came out, it was trending. It was looking at, uh, you know, what was keywords. And there was 100 copies of one movie, and that's all you could rent. And, and I, I think chasing the algorithm and looking for trending topics, it could be YouTube's downfall. I think they really need to encourage everybody uh, to have a voice. And although and they, yeah. They do, you know, but before before they went out of business, Blockbuster had actually done that too. As I recall, in the last two right. or three years that Blockbuster was around, they started to bring back what you were talking about, the foreign films and the black and white Did films. They? And, uh, yeah, they this was uh, you know, here I mean, here in the United States, Blockbuster was everywhere, right? All at once. Right. They were the chain. And and I think I think even they recognize that, right? It's homogenization, media homogenization. You right, know? right. So I right. mean, you can only watch, you know, like well, I, I probably the worst is knockoffs of Die Hard, right? I mean, right, you know, Die right. Hard on right. a. I mean, the, the the original came out, and and then they had Die right. Hard on every imaginable vehicle: Die Hard on a bus, Die Hard on a plane, Die Hard on a. That's you know, right. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, a winning and, formula, which is just which, which is just repeated. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. And uh, but I think there's so much on YouTube that there is a diversity. But I don't think that the actual individuals in their bedrooms making these films are really um, rewarded um, uh, that much. One or two bubble up. But it also, as I said, I don't know what the rules are. Um, some films that I make get an incredible audience and others, which I quite like, don't, you know, I, I say to Dorothy, my wonderful wife, I said, oh no, it's been viewed by two men and a dog. You know, that's my, uh, uh, she hears me saying that every day. You know, you start off hopeful and you get a few of your loyal supporters view it and then ooh, after 24 hours, you have to go and make another one. Why? I'm talking about the origin of the universe here, folks. You know, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's just, luckily, I like making films. <laughs> See, and I actually, I've gone the other way. Um, it, right. Straight, and most people aren't familiar with this word, but I, um, I've gone after long tail viewership. And, and the reason right. I do that, actually, it goes back to work that I did 20 years ago. Um, I, okay. I put stuff, I was doing video before YouTube. And I ended up uploading a lot of it to YouTube. And I had right. people, I, I was running the, the APEC conference and people had said, Tim, yeah. Yeah. you did yeah. work 20 years ago that, that, you know, I watch it and I love it. And this means something to me. In my case, I was stunned. I said, you actually watched that? I was like, oh my God, <laughs> that meant something right. to someone? Okay, well, mm -hmm. so that, that was one of the reasons that I started doing interviews. I was like, you know what? I want to put work out there so that, you know, when someone, like for instance, when fans of Professor Simon are out there saying, I want to learn more mm -hmm. about what he does, right? right? You know, right. I want right. them to be able to find that and then they'll learn from it as opposed to Joe Average right. on the street who's just looking to pass the time, you know? Oh, you're doing it very well, and you're a variety of guests and a variety of subjects are just are just fascinating. Um, I've learned so much, and actually, they've they've inspired me to look at more deeply at some of the subjects your guests have actually uh, talked about, which which have been which has been great. Yeah, no, and I think it's it's really fascinating going purposely for that long tail. I think I, I like it. 
think yeah, that's a it's, good way it's to, different. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, and I imagine I will I will never have the audience share that, you know, people like yourself have. And oh. and then the other thing that I don't do is I don't do a lot of editing. You spend hours and hours and hours editing those. Right. And I think I think people are aware <laughs> of that. I think they forget it. Right. But I mean, how, how but, long does it take? Do you, would you say to edit some of these some of the videos? That uh, you've done? The the. I'm a very fast editor. I've worked in broadcast since 1978. So for me, it's 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 pretty pretty easy. But uh, but, uh, but I do totally agree. I think the one skill um, for making a decent film is learn how to edit it. Yes. Um, for me, um, I spend a couple of days usually waking up in the morning, watching something, reading a lot, um, which um, I a subject which would resonate with my kind of audience, which are um, uh, 40 to 60 year old men. And I think if I'm interested in it, maybe they'd be interested in it. Um, I often then go out on my bicycle here in France where I live, my e-bike, and I ride around and I practice what I'm saying because I don't write a script, I don't have autocue. I just want to get the big thoughts in my head um, I then think about it, discuss it with Dorothy, who is obviously a genius, and um, she throws up some, usually some big curveballs. And then the next morning, early in the morning, before our dogs are up and I fed the sheep, which we have, um, I'll go down into my basement um, and actually just switch on the camera and record what I call me the A roll. Um, make a coffee, download the A-roll uh, into Final Cut Pro um, from the camera to a hard drive. While that's doing, having my coffee, my breakfast, I'll come up and just edit the A-roll together. And then, Tim, I'll spend the rest of the day um, or maybe two days editing, finding source material B-roll um, or thinking about music and graphics and things. And um, it a good publishing day. I try and publish something at the weekend because there's more people on YouTube viewing. And that gives me a bit of a break to try and make quite a, a sizable film once a week. Uh, but I can knock off a, a quick response video uh, in the same day. Ah, um, okay. Yeah, it, it, it depends. But yeah, but ed yeah, editing is the key. Yeah. Well, and, and let me ask. So you mentioned using Final Cut, and I know this is getting rather technical. So no, no, I I use Adobe Premiere, um, and right, I'm starting right. to think I'm starting to feel like a bit of a masochist because it, right. yeah, I I guess I would I I would no Premiere is fantastic. Um, it's it, cumbersome. Premiere, it, it is cumbersome. I, I mean, it's in the Adobe um family. Um, yes <laughs> <laughs> but that's its real advantage uh big movies big graphic content movies um only edit on premiere because they can seamlessly import from other adobe uh products and that's its i think its main advantage is it's part of that infrastructure that family um, whereas Final Cut Pro is very odd, in fact. It, uh, it's just a strange bit of software. It's it's relatively easy to use, but you can deep dive into, into quite complicated things. But it's deeply unprofessional. Apple have never made a pro version of Final Cut Pro because in the broadcast industry, we all work in teams. There's, may, there's an assistant uploading to drives and managing content. There's three or four people working on two or three of the episodes. There's an international editor picking up sequences and reversioning them. You can't do that on Final Cut Pro. I don't understand why Apple have never taken that leap into making it a net, uh, you know, a team shareable experience. It's ideal for one man bands in their bedroom making YouTube content, and it works really well, and it's very easy to, to learn. But Premiere is much more professional, avid media composers, the software we use at in broadcast, um, and uh, DaVinci Resolve is another good one. Um, it, it depends what you're doing. I, I quite like using them all because I... I've certainly worked on most of those software and I'm very much a 
an avid media composer man, but avid is like a hundred thousand dollar piece of kit, and yeah. it's uh, super pro, and it and it is designed around Teams, um, and I don't need it. So two hundred bucks to the Apple Store, Final Cut Pro, you can't beat it if you're not going to collaborate with anybody else. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That's a good point. Now, before yeah. in my case, before Premiere, I was using Sony Vegas, and I really like oh, yeah. Vegas, but. Um, right. it, it has its own set of drawbacks. It is not, I, what I found is it's not supported as well as the Adobe products. And, you know, right. as you mentioned, right for my day job, I use, you know, Photoshop and all these others. So it does help. It helps to have those all in one. Button. Sure. No. The same buttons, the same idea. No, no. If you, if you, if you're in the Adobe environment, Premiere is an excellent tool. I mean, certainly major Hollywood movies is, are edited on uh, Premiere and obviously Avid Media Composer, but yeah. um, almost none on Final Cut Pro. And it, it, it seems quite odd that Apple have gone down that way. I wonder how long Final Cut Pro is really going to be around. They need to bring out a Pro. Uh, version to encourage um, broadcasters to use it, but it's it's never. Happened. I imagine, I imagine it, it before long. I imagine that they may go that direction. I mean, oh. you know, I, I think one of the other changes is in terms of cinematography, right? As you mentioned, yeah. people are using Nikon's to shoot video, or right. they're using Nikon's to shoot film. Um, people are using iPhones sure. to shoot film. Oh, so fantastic! Yeah, and Apple are very. They've integrated a lot of the uh, iPhone technology into Final Cut Pro, so it interfaces with your iPhone very well. A, a, a great one that they've used, that they introduced as a software update this year was iPhones have a fantastic uh, voice isolation for talking in noisy environments, and now Final Cut Pro has um, voice isolation built in, and it, I just know it whoever wrote the coding for the phone they put it in and it it's it's brilliant you know if you've got a noisy background or an air conditioner or you're in the sea um or wind it takes it all out i mean obviously it can over on over compress it but with a with a with a light touch it's fantastic thank mm. you know yeah, no, it, it's good. Uh, that's what I always use it on everything now. It takes out all the mic rumbles and no, 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 it's good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Simon, on that note, why don't we close for today? And and I'm right. sure we will end up getting together to chit chat more. I, there, there's so much. Sure. There's so much happening, I guess, in this space right now. So. Sure. But yeah, sure. let me let me thank you so much for your time today. And I should close by asking, what is coming up next for you? What are you what are, what are your next uh, projects, and where do you see the road kind of stretching out from here? Um, interestingly, I'm being torn apart at this very moment, literally, uh, by t by a possible very long doc um, feature documentary, which we're trying to get funding for. Um, on UFOs. No, of course. Um, I got involved with a people, a number of people who experienced something strange at Rendlesham Forest, which is Britain's Roswell incident. And they're absolutely brilliant. And we're taking it from a science point of view when we're trying to really crack. Nick Pope, who you know very well, and said to us, if you understand what really happened at Rendlesham Forest, you will understand the true nature of uap as a phenomenon and we're taking that right now um to look at the history of what happened before it the date the location of what's happening and i'm super excited by what we're um we are in production now and it's it's going to be a good one and it's actually tearing me away from um from youtube content but 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 um I'm really super stoked by what hopefully in the next uh, this year we'll have out um, the answer to, I think, one of the biggest questions of what happened way back in 1980. But I think it has uh, it has some relevance to what's actually happening today. The key word, and I've noticed this word used now more and more um, in context of UAP, is the word weaponization. 
I mean, is that relevant? Is there something going on? Um, have some of those that weirdness of of a natural or a a strange phenomenon been exploited by our military and 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 that's that's what we're going to be looking at so stay tuned <laughs> absolutely absolutely stay tuned simon again thank you so much for your time today sir it's been a pleasure tim <laughs>